China. Once a weak and impoverished country, has undergone a tremendous transformation rarely seen in human history. It's reinvigorating itself, re-emerging as a major economic powerhouse. It's also opening up and interacting with the world like never before. What has happened since the People's Republic of China was founded in 1949? How has the country engaged with the world in the last 70 years? This five-episode documentary retraces the path China has taken, examining how it has impacted and has been impacted by the world. The fourth episode focuses on cultural exchanges. As one of the oldest civilizations on Earth, China has been interacting with other countries in the cultural sphere since ancient times. Today, as China continues to open up to the world, the intermingling of ideas between China and the international community has been brought to a much larger scale. This episode will discover how modern China has been embracing the world through cultural exchanges over the past seven decades and continues to forge its future. Food is perhaps the best starting point to understand a country and its culture. Wizard of the Wok chef Li Xin makes sure his kitchen stays on the cutting edge of China's ever competitive catering business while bringing a taste of Australia to his hungry customers. I specialize in Western cuisine. In the beginning, people in China thought Western food is just burgers and fries. Later, they became to realize that there was more to it. In 2018, China's nearly 1.4 billion population spent a record high of 636 billion US dollars eating out. A good number of the restaurants in the Middle Kingdom specialize in foreign cuisine. From the deep, satisfying tomahawk steak to the juicy, tender Korean barbecue. From smoking hot Indian curries to delicious Japanese sashimi or just French fries and coffees on the go. Each is telling a unique story of their own heritage through a thrilling symphony of texture and taste. Beijing is very multicultural. You get to taste all kinds of food from around the world here. An ocean away, diners get to experience the Chinese culture in its mouth-watering glory. There are more than 700,000 Chinese restaurants overseas. In them, the tales of the ancient civilization are being told through some of the sexiest dishes on earth. And China is at the heart of it. If you want to understand China, please go within that building in a restaurant during the lunch time. The, the role of the, the table. <laughs> You know, to create opportunities, to dialogue, also to make business, but to know each other. The world's most food-obsessed country is now no stranger to top-notch global gastronomy. But in the early years of the 1950s, after the People's Republic of China was founded, it was a completely different picture. Foreign restaurants in the country once held a special role for people to get connected with the outside world. The Moscow restaurant is one of them. Opened in 1954, the Moscow is virtually the first restaurant serving foreign food in Beijing. It created quite a sensation among the citizens of Beijing. They had made a huge impact on ordinary citizens and even the middle and upper class in the cultural circle. Magnificent and awe-inspiring, the 600-seat dining hall constructed as a part of the Beijing Exhibition Center resembles a Russian palace in miniature, 
owing to the Soviet Union's considerable influence on China at the time. The one-time ballroom is grand, epic even, with soaring ceilings and Soviet-style pillars. Both the design and construction were guided by Soviet architects and technicians, optimizing visitors' experience of Soviet culture. Wang Zhaozhong was one of the kitchen staff at the Moscow restaurant in the 50s. Our customers were mostly famous scholars, university professors, and students who had studied in the former Soviet Union. Wang's feelings about the restaurant are shared by many Beijingers who affectionately nickname it Lao Mo or Old Moscow. For a long time, it required special meal tickets to get in. So when the restrictions were later removed, dining at Lao Mo carried a sense of being privileged and soon became a fashionable experience. To many, the Moscow restaurant is where they first learned about Western dining etiquette, especially how to use knives and forks. When the first batch of Soviet experts came to train us on how to prepare hot dishes, dessert and cold dishes, we all participated. China's cross-cultural adventure in the 1950s was dominated by its contact with the former Soviet Union. The Beijing Exhibition Center, which houses the Moscow restaurant, was built in 1954 at the high point of Sino-Soviet relations. Originally named the Soviet Exhibition Center, it was first built to host the exhibition of Soviet economic and cultural achievements for China to learn from Russia's economic and scientific successes. Soon, grand multi-purpose exhibition halls like the one in Beijing were built in Shanghai, Wuhan and Guangzhou, enabling visitors throughout China to learn about Soviet life and industry, enjoy Soviet paintings, watch Soviet ballet and savour Russian culinary delights all in one building. So we came into contact with foreign books, movies and dramas. The Soviet Exhibition Center was undoubtedly a window for cultural exchanges at the time. Back in the 1950s, in the Soviet Exhibition Center's circular open-air theater, many Chinese people saw, for the first time in their lives, the Russian ballet Swan Lake. It was also during this time that Chinese ballet started to take shape under Soviet guidance. 65 years later, the theatre has continued to stage dance and singing performances all year round, enriching people's cultural life. China may have come a long way over the past seven decades, but the intercultural exchange between China and Russia has never faded, and it continues to this day. We have collaborated with youth ballet schools here in China. I love performing with Chinese children. They are very adorable. We create art and demonstrate art. Art has always been seen as a complete entity, and this is the cultural exchanges happening between China and Russia. In the audience, a special guest is in attendance. A household name and a veteran singer from the China Oriental Song and Dance Ensemble, Zhu Mingying was the unquestioned centerpiece of Chinese pop music when she was young. Born in 1950, Zhu Mingying finds herself growing up with the People's Republic of China. It was just like yesterday for me. I'm lucky enough to grow up in this era. I saw how far China has come till this day through my own eyes. Best known for performing African songs, Zhu Mingying has been immersed in arts all her life. Having been invited to perform at the 4th China Africa Youth Festival, the artist now in her 60s has never left the limelight. Yeah, 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 yeah
When you can't communicate with foreigners through language, you can communicate with your heart and soul through music, dance and art. You then realize you have done something incredibly great. For many Chinese audiences, Zhu Mingying was the artist who introduced them to the vibrant beat and color of African music and dance in the late 70s. In the 1970s and 80s, during the reform and opening up period, I learned the moves from our African friends. Because I had to dance while singing African songs, if my moves were not the same as theirs, people would notice it wasn't right. As a teenager, Zhu Mingying participated in the Peking Dance Academy, where rigorous training later won her a slot in the highly heralded Oriental Song and Dance Ensemble. The ensemble was founded in 1962, but I came in 1961. Premier Zhou Enlai wanted to establish the Oriental Song and Dance Ensemble. He wanted to train a batch of successors, and I was one of the successors appointed by the Premier. She credits former Premier Zhou Enlai as her inspiration after he visited the ensemble in the 1960s and called on the singers and dancers to be more than just artists, but also diplomats. Zhu Mingying then decided to add a fresh element to the troupe's routine African songs and dances. I had sat on the ground outside the Beijing Foreign Studies University for a whole day without eating or drinking. The wind was so strong, it was really cold, and I kept waiting because I didn't know when he was going to come out. We all waited for him, then I learned the pronunciation from him word by word. In order to stage a good performance, Zhu Mingying spent many years learning African languages. <laughs> Adorned in flowing costumes, she soon became synonymous with traditional African songs and a key member of the art troupe. As well as bringing foreign songs and dances to China, she was also invited to perform in Africa, Latin America and other Asian countries, winning over her audiences with her sweet and passionate voice. I wanted to sing all over the world. I wanted people to see a Chinese singer who can bridge gaps and build friendships through songs, connecting the whole world. After a performance in Egypt, she not only received thunderous applause, but was also given a lovely nickname, Bas Bosa, a tasty dessert in Egypt, also the name of his song. They played the song for a whole year on TV, so everybody knows there was a bass bosa in China. The 1960s was a difficult time for China. The country's diplomatic relations were restricted mainly to the countries of Africa, Latin America and Asia. The purpose of the Oriental Song and Dance Ensembles was to bring about friendlier connections with these countries by introducing them to Chinese culture and by learning their music and dance to show to the people of China. And it worked. Pre-modern civilizations, so they, they were kind of fused with each other. And at the same time, China did not lose its identity on the way, which is uh, quite amazing and, and fascinating to see. So we have this very, uh, this learning attitude, uh, this, this opening up. As Zhu Mingying puts it, her success in bridging different cultures was made possible by knowing each other's language as a first step. As China transitioned itself to the 70s, the need for high-quality translation soon became a top priority for the country to get connected with the world. Luo Jinde, a veteran translator in his 80s, knows it all. In 1971, China resumed its position at the United Nations to serve the UN. An institution called the Beijing Translation and Publishing Division was established in Beijing. The Beijing Translation and Publishing Division was later renamed China Translation Corporation. After becoming a professional translator at the China Translation Corporation, Lord Jinde got the chance to work at China's office at the United Nations in Geneva. As China further opened up to the world in the 80s, the works of Luo Jinde and his fellow translators played a crucial role in enabling effective and empathetic communications between different cultures. 
These magazines, commissioned by the UNESCO, are published by us in Chinese. The pictures in here introduce different countries' education, science, culture and history to people. After they were published in China, they became a small window for Chinese people to learn about the outside world. Today, many young translating professionals are following in Luo Jinder's footsteps. The country's top translation company now has more than 700 translators specializing in 30 languages. Language is the carrier of culture. Translation means introducing cultures on different carriers to others and communicating with each other. So translation is a job of great importance. As China fully embraces globalization, the need for translation work has also witnessed exponential growth. In the spring of 2019, an art exhibition in Beijing captivated the attention of the art world. Entitled A Journey Through Cultures, the solo exhibition at the Beijing Padma Art Space presented 60 works by French artist Jean-Charles Pigeot and a chance for people to experience art at the intersection of civilizations. From Buddhism to Taoist beliefs and the porcelain culture, the strong presence of Chinese elements made people wonder what has created the unusual connection between the French sculptor and the ancient oriental civilization. Born in Paris, Jean-Charles Pigeot has been traveling around the world since the 1990s, creating contemporary art pieces with inspiration drawn from historical and cultural scenes. His art studio sits in downtown Paris. As unexpected as it could be, Pigeot's first contact with China was at an acupuncture session when he was 11. Intrigued by Taoist beliefs, Pigeot began to explore more about China and developed his early knowledge about the Chinese culture from his favorite museums in Paris. I studied the traces of ancient China through books and museums in Paris. I learned that Jade Song symbolizes Earth and Jade B symbolizes the sky. I try to make the connection by applying those symbols to my works, connecting the East and the West is what I do. But it was not until he went to the Longmen grottos that he was completely blown away by the story of China. About 100 kilometers south of Paris lies Pigeot's countryside workshop in Echelleurs. Pigeot calls it a retreat from his busy urban life where he can experiment with large sculptures and avant-garde ideas like this one in the Arcade series. This is a piece I created called Meditation. It incorporated Buddhist thinking. Arcade, or meditative spaces in Indian, conveys Pigeot's understanding of Buddhism. The outer surface made of plaster looks like samsara pagodas, while the hollowed-out golden insides resemble the contours of the Buddha in traditional Chinese folk style. Pichot's artwork is emblematic of the growth in the field of cultural dialogue between France and China since the two countries first established diplomatic ties in 1964. More than two million Chinese people now visit France each year, and about 100,000 French and Chinese are learning each other's languages. The two countries have also embraced each other's movies, literature, museums, cultures and heritage. 
Jean-Charles Pichot was on another trip to China. This time, his destination for artistic inspiration is Beijing. His student, Liu Xiaoming, is picking him up at the airport. Xiaoming has suggested Pichot visit a few historical sites in Beijing, including Guo Zijian or the Beijing Imperial Academy. First built in the year 1306, the Beijing Imperial Academy was the top institution of learning during many of China's ancient dynasties. Chinese people traditionally believe that the earth is square and heaven is round. This is a concept that's reflected in most ancient Chinese architecture, and it's something Pijou has incorporated into his artwork. This is where the emperor used to teach every four years. The interesting part about it is that this building's base is square, and square symbolizes earth, just like the jade song. And there's water surrounding the building in a circle. The concept of earth is square and heaven is round has inspired me a lot. The connection between China and Europe can be traced back to as early as the year 130 BC, when the ancient Silk Road was the most prosperous. The ancient trade route linking China with the West carried goods and ideas between the two great civilizations of Rome and China. This is a two-way exchange that keeps on going. It's an exchange of knowledge and a powerful interpersonal exchange that goes beyond the diplomatic world. It's a profound type of art. China also received Nestorian Christianity and Indian Buddhism via the Silk Road. The roots had a lasting impact on commerce, culture and history that resonates even today. The Silk Road does not belong to any single country. It's a product of exchanges and interactions between cultures and civilizations. Dijon has now set up a new studio in a suburb of Beijing, working on projects bringing his French heritage and Chinese culture together. His cross-cultural journey is only beginning. China, once a weak and impoverished country, has undergone a tremendous transformation rarely seen in human history. It's reinvigorating itself, re-emerging as a major economic powerhouse. It's also opening up and interacting with the world like never before. What has happened since the People's Republic of China was founded in 1949? How has the country engaged with the world in the last 70 years? This five-episode documentary retraces the path China has taken, examining how it has impacted and has been impacted by the world. Ma Ke, a law PhD candidate at Peking University, is heading to Switzerland soon as a visiting scholar. To make his study a little smoother, Ma Ke has decided to take some lessons at the Goethe Institute in Beijing to learn German, one of Switzerland's four official languages. Language sometimes provides you a new angle. The most practical benefit is that it could help me read German literature. The Goethe Institute Mark goes to sits in Beijing's famous art district 798. The abandoned factories that house 798 pretty much invented industrial chic in the capital. Its sprawling complex of repurposed warehouses is now fully packed with galleries, shops and restaurants. In 2015, the Goethe Institute opened their current flagship location as one of 798's Bauhaus-inspired gallery spaces. Itself, a sort of relic of exchange inspired by 1950s East German architecture. Like the 
It has since put on a strong, rotating program of art, music, film and literature events with a focus on creating dialogues between creatives from Germany and China. First, I think the Goethe Institute was really like a window to Germany or a door and then more and more it became really like a stage where people from culture, from German and European and Chinese culture can meet and interact. And while Ma Ke is learning all about Germany, Ariane Kammerhoff is soaking up Chinese culture at a Confucius Institute in Munich. I think learning Chinese is quite important for me in the future. Since globalization started, China's economy is becoming more and more important on the international stage. Speaking Chinese makes people happy. I'm very interested in Chinese culture as well. The first Confucius Institute was opened in Seoul, Korea in 2004. Today, there are more than 500 institutes worldwide, 19 of which are in Germany aiming to promote mutual understanding, cultural appreciation, and linguistic comprehension between China and the world. Since China embarked on its road of reform and opening up in the late 1970s, international cultural institutions like the Goethe Institute have sprouted all over the country. Constantly clocking events year-round, they work to stimulate cultural activities in collaboration with academics, curators, artists and writers from around the world in the form of lectures, exhibitions and talks, providing immersive cultural experiences. Language is definitely one of the cornerstones of cultural exchange and cultural knowledge. And then you can have a dialogue. And so, so by means of that dialogue, we, we also create, create more understanding, more knowledge, and more uh, sophisticated ways of, uh, of also developing global culture in the future, I think. In Shanghai, yoga, the ancient Indian practice, is meeting with Chinese martial arts underwater. Muchi Miya, an action movie star and a yoga entrepreneur, feels there's a strong connection between China and India. I want to put Chinese traditional arts and Indian yoga together. I think 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 to real life. The team, however, finds it quite a challenge. Miya's business idea was, in part, born out of her passion for Kung Fu. <laughs> Having made her career breakthrough as an action star, martial arts has always been a part of her life. Now she's ready to explore new possibilities with the ancient practice, with a touch of yoga. Back then, our understanding of yoga was limited only to poses. Not surprisingly, Miya became a yoga aficionado and was drawn to everything Indian. Fascinated by the culture, she went on to study yoga at an ashram in the holy Indian city of Varanasi. If you really want to learn about a country, you have to go there, know the locals and experience the culture yourself. Cultural interactions between China and India have been robust. Yoga has become immensely popular all over China in the past few decades and is emerging as a major fitness discipline. It's estimated that about 10 million Chinese now practice yoga regularly. 
The Indian yoga emphasizes appreciation and cherishing everything. Chinese martial arts, however, focus on filial piety, benevolence, righteousness, courtesy, wisdom, and faith. I believe bringing the two cultures together will help boost the mutual understandings and exchanges between the two countries. Promoting Kung Fu yoga has become Mia's latest mission. Mia decided to seek help from an Indian yoga master living in China. Popularity of yoga in China over the years has attracted scores of Indian yoga teachers to either start their own institutes or work for popular yoga studios. But Dr. Avinash Mishra from S. Vyasa University, the world's top yoga institute, is here on a different mission. He's here to study traditional Chinese martial arts. While sharing a piece of traditional Indian roti over lunch, Dr. Mishra agreed to help Mia with her experiment. His lab at Svyasa University could help scientifically test out whether Mia's Kung Fu Yoga will indeed boost health conditions, such as improving cardiovascular strength or reducing anxiety. In India, roti sharing symbolizes true friendship. China and India are home to two of the world's oldest civilizations. Buddhism spread from India to China, and merchants established trading posts in each other's countries. Scholars like Xuan Zhang traveled from China to Indian universities such as Nalanda, and much of Indian history has recently been rediscovered by using Chinese texts. Archaeological findings suggest that the cultural exchanges between the two Asian giants has a history of at least 2,000 years. If you start from remote antiquity, so it is almost you know, 5,000 years old. It was a great culture, great civilization, and surprisingly, you know, it is a, a continuous civilization. Uh, as Tagore has said that you know, uh, the civilizational lamp of uh, China and India, it is still burning. To help Dr. Mishra grasp the true essence of Chinese Kung Fu, Mia takes him to her fighting club. There, Dr. Mishra learns how to strike Mani's fists and gets to experience the Kung Fu spirit firsthand. Mia is now trying out her new ideas at her yoga studio while Dr. Mishra has left for India, bringing Kung Fu Yoga back to his lab, carrying on the experiment. The duo's attempt with Kung Fu Yoga is just a microscopic view of the cultural interactions that have flourished between the two ancient civilizations over the years. Beyond India, Chinese martial arts has also created a unique connection between China and Japan. Tokyo is gearing up for the next Shorinji Kenpo World Taikai in 2021. The Japanese martial arts convention organized by the World Shorinji Kenpo Organization is held every four years across the world. Shorinji Kenpo, founded by martial artist Doshin So in 1947 in Japan, is considered to be a modified version of Shaolin Kung Fu, named after the Buddhist temple Shaolin in China's central Hunan province. Yuuki So, the daughter of Doshin So, is the current president of Shorinji Kenpo organization. In June 2019, Yuuki So led a delegation of 60 people to visit China's Shaolin Temple, marking the 40th anniversary of their pilgrimage activities. The Japanese martial arts group and China's Shaolin Temple have had a long history of cultural exchanges since Do Xin So visited Shaolin Temple in 1979. Despite problems, 
China and Japan are both Asian countries and have a common culture. The two countries should take this seriously. We can't contribute to the global balance without shared understanding. For a long time, movies featuring Kung Fu have been synonymous with Chinese cinema. But things may have taken a turn in 2019, as one Chinese science fiction film, The Wandering Earth, appeared in global theaters grossing over 650 million US dollars worldwide. As of October the 1st, 2019, it's the third highest learning film in the history of Chinese cinema. Guo Fan, the director of China's smash hit sci-fi movie, The Wandering Earth, is shooting a TV commercial for a change. This time, he's on the other side of the camera. The world-famous cognac brand from France chose Guo Fan to be their spokesperson for a reason. His massive success in filmmaking and the global influence that comes with it. The Wandering Earth, a sci-fi blockbuster, is based on the novella of the same title, written in 2000 by Chinese science fiction author and Hugo Award winner Liu Cixin. It's about Earth's migration to a new solar system to escape annihilation. Having made its way to Netflix, The Wandering Earth has a new chance to find a wider audience in addition to its release in the United States, Canada, Australia and New Zealand. But Gore Fan is also working on something else that might excite the fans, a possible sequel to The Wandering Earth. But he says none of it would have been possible without China's real space power today. Only when our country is strong and rejuvenated can we have a shot in sci-fi movies. Because our country's space technology has reached a certain level today, viewers start to believe in what they saw in our movies, including the Chinese astronauts and Chinese spacecrafts. <laughs> Gorfan has been seen as the pioneer of China's heavy industry sci-fi movies. But the four years of filming The Wandering Earth is described by Gorfan as full of tough choices. Over the past four years, we have accumulated more lessons than experience. We especially want to record these lessons and hope that they can be shared. Catching up with Hollywood has long been a collective ambition for the Chinese film industry. 75% of the special effects of The Wandering Earth were completed by domestic teams and 25% by German and Korean teams. It's a story of growing confidence and sophistication among Chinese filmmakers, as well as a learning process across different cultures. We have to find something. We have to find a way to build our own industrial system, from concept to the filming process from formulating a plan to finally implementing it. I think we need to build a whole learning system. Although the costumes were made in New Zealand, the movie still flashed an abundance of originality, deeply based in the Chinese culture, from the aesthetics of the film to storylines and script writing. Nevertheless, Gorfan finds the entire project a magical journey that brings everybody together. 
Now is not the time to be complacent. We need to keep on going, since we still have a long way to go. So I hope that in the future, my team and I could continue to work on the production of sci-fi movies and the improvement of film industrialization. 2019 has been a fruitful year for Guo Fan. His movie is now being dubbed a milestone of China's filmmaking history. But his exploration with different film cultures is far from over. The Wandering Earth is said to have opened a new era in Chinese filmmaking. And as Chinese movies go global, China is also welcoming numerous foreign motion pictures into its own market, allowing global filmmakers to achieve huge earnings. China's fast-growing box office is projected to reach over 12 billion US dollars in 2020, overtaking the United States as the world's largest film market. China, which boasts the largest number of screens and biggest movie audience in the world, has always been a huge and lucrative market for Hollywood. Beyond film, China's cultural interactions with the US have expanded to almost every other sector after the establishment of China-US diplomatic relations in 1979. In 1987, Kentucky Fried Chicken became the first American fast food chain to open a restaurant in China. Today, Yum China, which counts KFC, Pizza Hut and Taco Bell in its stable of brands, has more than 8,000 restaurants in the country. American culture is also notably present in China through contemporary TV shows. Since China opened up its economy in the 1980s, American TV shows have been a way for Chinese people to practice English while also learning about Western pop culture and getting entertained at the same time. When the hit drama series Friends aired in the 1990s and 2000s, it captivated Chinese viewers with its charismatic yet accessible depiction of life for young middle-class Americans. Over the years, pop stars in the US from Elvis and Madonna to Taylor Swift and Maroon 5 have attracted a huge fan base in China. American literature, such as works by Hemingway, are read by generations of Chinese, young and old. Sporting events such as the NFL, Super Bowl and the NBA games have enjoyed massive viewership in China. In the meantime, Chinese culture has also flourished in the US. Major international cultural events such as the Smithsonian Folklife Festival have brought Chinese customs and traditions to American soil. In 2014, China was featured as a theme country at the festival. Some 120 folk artists from China demonstrated their heritage, creativity, and masterful skills on the National Mall in Washington, DC. As such, cultural collaborations have always remained active between the world's two biggest economies, and they have only grown deeper. In the heart of downtown Beijing, a unique market fair is taking place at a bustling mall, giving urbanites a rare close look at the indigenous Miao and Bai cultures. People call it the Remote Mountain Bazaar, a hidden culture with great complexity revealed to the world like never before. 74-year-old Grandma Pan, a Miao native, is bringing her embroidery work to the fair, hoping to make some big bucks. All this is made possible by Xia Hua, the founder of the fair, and a fashion designer who has devoted herself to bringing the exquisite folk art to the world, all inspired by the Miao heritage. In 2018, Xia Hua brought a new collection featuring Miao embroidery to catwalks in London. The show created quite a spectacle with embroidery artists engaging in their craft live on stage. Among the audience were ambassadors, fashion editors, 
and influencers. The immaculate craftsmanship and visionary style opened eyes around the world. Situated in southwestern China, Guizhou province is home to some of the world's most magnificent landscapes, as well as colorful minority cultures. The local Miao people have been living here for thousands of years, giving birth to their own customs and cultures. The Miao ethnic group lacks its own written language. For centuries, their embroidery has taken on the role of documenting the community's history and culture. For them, drafting plans is unnecessary. Simply by utilizing their natural instincts, mature skills, extraordinary memory and colorful imagination, Miao women give birth to myriad wondrous pieces of embroidery, each narrating a vivid story. Xia Hua first visited the village 15 years ago on a trip to aid in local poverty alleviation efforts. Inspired by the craftsmanship and the wisdom of Miao women, Xia Hua decided to up the ante by taking it to the global stage. I hope that today's Chinese aesthetics can be seen beyond museums, just as many of us get to know Italy and France through fashion, culture or a piece of artwork. I hope that people all over the world can understand the most beautiful China in this way too. After the success at the market fair, Grandma Pan has decided to leave her home village and join Xia Hua's business in Beijing. Together, they're ready to take on the world. <laughs> Xia Hua and her team are coming up with new designs. The goal here is to make everyone catch the Chinese spice while feeling comfortable wearing the pieces. Xia Hua has brought her friends from the UK to Grandma Pan's home village in Guizhou. Fascinated by what they saw at the fashion show in London, these industry elites and influencers have made the journey to see the story firsthand. We have more than 5,000 kinds of traditional motifs from different ethnic groups in China, and we let people use them openly. I think this is also a very important database to help Chinese culture go global. Chinese creativity, global design, real Chinese creation, ready for global customers. With the rapid growth of the Chinese economy and the need for cultural expression, a large number of emerging designers have started to create using their own voice to deal with the issue of heritage and identity. Xia Hua and Grandma Pan are doing whatever they can to help bridge the gap between different cultures one step at a time. Asia is the birthplace of many ancient civilizations in the world. For thousands of years, the cultures of Asia have traded, interacted, and exchanged ideas. These encounters have shaped our world. This diversity of culture has brought about a collective strength benefiting all of humanity. All our civilizations are enriched and developed through exchanges with other civilizations. We belong not only to a different culture or country, but also to a community with a shared future. 80 miles to the west from Shanghai lies a small water town called Wujian. Crisscrossed by picturesque canals and lined with traditional buildings, Wujian has a history of over 1,300 years. Every October, it hosts the Wujian Theatre Festival. The grand celebration of theatrical arts brings together some of the world's most creative and daring shows, transforming the ancient town into a tantalizing beast of culture. Mm -hmm. 
every cafe, banquet and ceremony becomes a chance for everyone to talk with everyone across cultures about theatre. In fact, we have been looking for performances all over the world, and we are trying our best to come to Wu Zhen to perform. Since 2007, Wu Zhen has hosted more than 10,000 art exhibitions and cultural events. At a time when globalization is at a crossroads, Wu Zhen is offering a unique way to create relationships between theatre artists and thinkers, bringing diverse cultures together. That is to say, we hope to use Wu Zhen and theatrical drama as a window, allowing the whole of China to see the world's theatrical drama, to see the world through drama, and in the meantime, allowing the world to see China through Wu Zhen Theatre Festival. By standing on the shoulders of its ancestors, China has transformed itself in incredible ways over the last seven decades, modernizing at a speed matched by no others. A vast land where different worlds meet, a melting pot where past and present connect. China is an ancient civilization experiencing unprecedented change, and it's now open to the world like never before, engaging in a dialogue of cultures and civilizations.